The U.S. endorses a new international business initiative for Haiti. But is it helping or exploiting a desperate workforce? You're watching Inside Story Americas from Washington. Hello, I'm Shihan Bratansi. Bill and Hillary Clinton were in Haiti this week to unveil a project that its backers say will help reduce poverty in the country, a $300 million industrial park. It's hoped that the presence of the former U.S. President and current Secretary of State will encourage further foreign investment in the venture. We have been united behind a single goal making investments in this country's people and your infrastructure that help put Haiti finally on the path to broad-based economic growth with a more vibrant private sector and less dependence on foreign assistance. Its promoters say the Caracol Industrial Center near the northern city of Cap Haitian has the potential to provide tens of thousands of jobs and that it's finally a sign of regeneration in Haiti following the destruction of the 2010 earthquake. But critics say the park is little more than a glorified sweatshop. Already workers allege that foreign companies aren't even paying the minimum wage of $5 a day. Local farmers say they were forced off their land to make way for the development. Meanwhile, the problems exacerbating Haiti's slow recovery from the earthquake have been highlighted once more with the final demise of the Yele Haiti charity. Its founder, the pop star Wyclef Jean, once trumpeted the venture as Haiti's greatest asset and ally. But a report earlier this month uncovered financial irregularities that squandered millions of dollars in post-earthquake donations. Yet another blow to the morale of many Haitians came last week with the renewal of the UN's mandate in the country. UN troops were found to have been responsible for introducing cholera to Haiti and the deaths of thousands. They're also the subject of a string of abuse claims. So what is the best way to aid Haiti's recovery? With me to discuss this, Kim Ives, filmmaker and journalist with Haiti Liberté, the newspaper. Next to him, Robert McGuire, who's the chairman of Haiti's working group at the U.S. Institute of Peace. And from New York, Manolio Charlottin, executive editor of the Haitian Times. Uh, Manolio, is the Caracol Industrial Park building Haiti back better, do you think? Um, I think the, the, the best answer to that is, is a resounding yes and no. Um, I think some of the same policies that continue to marginalize um, the local families impacted directly by these policies and these new industries continue. Um, it's the same story we're seeing time and time again. Um, though Caracol represents the largest and the most modern industrial park zone in the Caribbean, um, some of the same practices of exploiting workers are continuing. Um, I think that it's really important for us to note, as you did in your opening, that the basic minimum wage that was that was raised back in early early this month is yet to be respected by say uh, the anchor tenant of the Kyoko Industrial Park Zone. So that tells us that some of the same um, sort of exploitative policies and practices are still intact in the so-called New Haiti venture. Yeah, actually, human rights activists in Haiti did speak with workers about conditions in Haiti and also with the farmers who surrendered their land for the industrial park. Here's some of what they found. He said we would receive a sum of money that even when our children had children, it would be more than they need. That's what he said, and that's why everyone agreed to give their land. They pressured us too. We gave the land because they said it was government land, but they required us to give it and said we would make a profit. Now for my half a hectare, they gave me $1,200. Everything. I had all the fruit there. Every day I harvested from my land. In fact, it was Congo beans that I harvested and sold to send my children to school from the bags I would sell in Cape Haitien. But now everyone is just sitting and waiting. We are empty. We have nothing to do for ourselves. They said they won't take elderly people to work in the industrial park. They won't take people in their 40s. I could go work at the park to make a little money, but they said they won't take older people, and I am an older person. 
The workers are hungry, they are thirsty and have problems with transportation. They promise to pay us $52.50 for 15 days, but we don't receive that amount of money every time. I spend $15 for transport and $15 to eat each day for 15 days. When we are finished, there's not much left over for anything else. They treat us like slaves that are working for them. They don't give us transport or food, only water to drink, but they give us only one cup that isn't even clean. This while we have a cholera epidemic. Kim Ives, I mean, do these allegations, though, um, do they have to be balanced out with some sort of sense of long-term good for Haiti's, Haiti's economic development? No, I think this is far, far, far from building back better. I think this is building back in the very worst way. I mean, not only are the wages of workers going down, back in the 80s when I made a film on the assembly industries in Haiti, workers were making more then. They were making 264 a day, and now it's less. It's more around 250, even less. And uh, in addition to the fact that they've in fact paved over uh, an, uh, an ecological jewel in the country, which is, uh, I mean, the head of Haiti's Audubon Society called it heresy, that they would take this area of virgin mangrove forests uh, 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 along with coral reefs and a river and farmland that was supporting 366 farms and pave it over to put these sweatshops. Well, I mean, whose idea was it then, um, Professor, as far as we can tell, though, to site this industrial park on fertile agricultural yeah. land anyway, especially given the food insecurity of Haiti? Well, I, I think that there was kind of a rush to get something done um, after the earthquake, but, but actually this idea came up before the earthquake. Right. And I think the, um, to be fair, I mean, the idea of decentralizing investment in Haiti is something that um, I think has been called upon since the experience in the 70s and 80s when Industrial Park was concentrated in Port-au-Prince and ended up in slumification around Port-au-Prince right. and people coming in. How the lessons been the learned from baby dog Duvalier's economic plan? Well, is this pretty much the same? Are we just going to get slums well, around Well, the this is where I'm a bit conflicted about it. I'm not quite sure yet. I mean, the, the decentralization of investment, uh, despite the fact that there are other controversies over the land that was chosen and, and perhaps some of the offshoots on that, I mean, the decentralization is a positive move. But whether or not this will result in any lasting jobs, any vertical integration within the, or horizontal integration within the economy um, is a big question to me. And the biggest concern I have is that this caracol has kind of taken all the wind out of the room, all the oxygen out of the room. It's all that people talk about. Um, and yet it's going to create at the maximum over six years, 65,000 jobs, which is really just mm -hmm. a drop in the bucket. Um, I noted with some interest when the State Department put out its uh, own strategy, strategic plan for Haiti in January of 2011, it was noted that the agricultural sector with proper investment could create 700,000 jobs. Now that's significant in Haiti, but all the attention given to Caracol, all the investment given to Caracol, and the winners are going to be, yes, a few people will get jobs, the investors of course who will make plenty of money. And, and I guess the U.S. Congress will be happy because the HOPE Act, which provides this kind of subsidized trade for, for textiles coming out of Haiti, will be met. So um, there, there are a lot of different agendas at play I put here. a question mark after those winners who get the jobs. Well, it, true, but, you know, it's like that old expression, um, I've been down so long it looks like up to me. You know, I mean, the people who get those jobs will certainly be happy they have them. It's probably not their aspiration to want to work in those jobs, but there are few opportunities but, but for then, them. But then again, Manolia also, I mean, the, the anchor tenant who you uh, refer to, say, the Sei trading company from South Korea, I mean, they have a pretty troubled labor record anyway in, in Guatemala and other places. They've, mm -hmm. they've been alleged to be responsible for death threats, intimidation against union organizers and so forth. Again, I mean, as you add up all of these <laughs> these factors, the, 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 the citing of it, the lack of an environmental impact assessment before the decision was made, um, the, the, the record, the labor record of the company. Um, I mean, can you really say that, that, that on the whole, then this is still a positive, a positive development for Haiti? I think um, Professor McGuire's sort of um, cautious um, optimism around the larger um, component of this, of decentralizing um, investments is really important, but decentralizing the same policies does not change the status quo. It just moves it around. And so 
SEA has had a couple of months to prove whether or not it can treat its workers fairly and pay what they were what they were owed, and they weren't even able to do that. And we're just we're just a couple of months in, and so. What I think is really important is, for instance, um, D Classe Apparel was the sort of newest tenant that was uh, inaugurated during this this large inaugural on Monday, and they're, they're supposed to be cr creating about 5,000 jobs, but yet we're not we're not hearing about some of the specifics about what kinds of jobs. Um, is it the same sort of you know sweatshop and and things like that? So I think w while the intention to um, decentralize is really important. I think if you're, if you're applying the same policies to the workers, there's not much change. And, at, to, and to Kim Ives point about who are, who are the winners here, it's the investors. And it should be both the investors and the workers and Haiti that wins out of this um, Caracol project. And that's not necessarily the case as of right now. But, but can it ever be Kim Ives? I mean, it, do Macchiadoras, these kind of, these, these sort of factories uh, in export zones, are they ever really a recipe for sustainable long-term economic development? No, I don't think so. And, and, and fundamentally, I think it's a question that the Haitian people should be deciding their future. These are not these are not decisions being made by the Haitian people. They're being made by the Clintons and their coterie, uh, including the Haitian government uh, that is now in power, which uh, fundamentally they shoehorned into power through an illegal election back in uh, 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 March of 2011. I, I think. Uh, you know, these are the same policies as Casey Stengel said. You know, we it's deja vu all over again. <laughs> this is what uh, um, Jean Claude Duvalier was pushing, the Taiwan of the Caribbean back in the 80s, and uh, look where Haiti has ended up. No, Haiti needs to be able to feed itself. It needs to put people back to work on the land growing food. That's what that land was doing, and now they're going to be uh, having another city soleil spring up instead. But, but as things stand, and, and, and as you mentioned, you know, Bill Clinton has a huge role in this, now there's a great deal of U.S. government investment. How much regulation and oversight will there be over labor practices, environmental practices in such, a, such an environmentally sensitive area, uh, and, and so on, as far as we can yeah. tell? There's going to be no oversight. I mean, already, even the, the, the company that did the study for putting it in there, a company called Koyos, said that, you know, environmentally, they went back and did a second study. They said this one is... It, this is not a good place to put a put a, put a, uh, a, a zone like that. But it's the U.S. So, money that's going in to build the heavy, the heavy fuel oil power plant. Right, exactly. 125 million bucks. I mean, can you imagine how many houses that could build for the 390,000 people who still do, don't have homes? And instead, but also the most polluting sort of that power plant. Right? right. It's going to dump it right into the uh, river that comes through there and goes into the bay. But but I do think there's going to be considerable oversight and, and monitoring of this. I mean, w once you have Hillary and Bill Clinton, the spotlight's going to be on you. And, and I do know, for example, that the U.S. Embassy is beefing up its staff so it can monitor the labor practices at this factory. I suppose the ILO will also be involved. So if anything, if there is good monitoring and right. serious monitoring, it might have beneficial aspect by improving the whole sector in Haiti because but, but is it's there any not reason for confidence at Manolia though Bill Clinton again yeah enormous <laughs> unelected authority over Haiti um, yeah, he has in the past now expressed guilt about his record in Haiti as president in, in, in helping destroy the agricultural sector by forcing Haiti to r remove its tariffs on it on imports but um, is there any sense of transparency about his decision making about who is getting contracts about uh, uh, and so on given the amount of power that he has and indeed input from local organizations I mean when we t let's go back a little bit to the, um, the economic the, the post earthquake recovery panel that he co-chaired along with um, current prime minister uh, some of the major challenges that they had was overseeing transparency around the process of who received projects and bids, right? And so he has had a chance, I think, to demonstrate whether or not he will be doing better in Haiti than he did when he was president of the United States. Um, I, think the, I think the record is still out on that. I, I'm not as optimistic because this sort of, this sort of um, policies have been in place for quite some time where the elite um, and a few sort of connected folks on the island get access to some of these great investments at the risk of um, the local populations who are impacted. Now, in terms of Kayakot itself, I don't think it's a necessarily a bad thing to have an industrial a park zone in the Northeast. I mean, Kapaisia is the second largest city in Haiti, right? But the challenge is, 
doing it in, in, in conjunction with the communities and having complete full transparency and giving them value for their land. I mean, most of the people who got monies were about 500 to, uh, to 1,500 U.S. dollars for 1.5 to 2 acres of land that they were using for fruits, vegetables that they were selling to send their kids to school. When you think about the valuation of that, it doesn't make sense, right? So who's really winning? If we actually go down in the numbers and, and take out some of the sort of partisan um, um, uh, uh, looking at this in sort of part of a way, just take out the economics and the numbers. When these 409 families lose, Haitians lose, right? And so to me, I think at least at the beginning of this project, um, they, have, they have created a place for themselves to prove to the Haitian people this will be different. And so far, they have not had a good start. I mean, this is back to Kim Ives. I mean, you've, you've been monitoring this for years, this idea of, of Haiti as NGOistan, where these, 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 these NGOs come in, enormous amount of money. In fact, you know, USAID, the recent report came out, they've now spent $450 million in contracts. They're 70 percent of DC area contractors and that, that money has gone to, basically, with very little oversight and accountability once again. How does this keep happening? Why is it all so dysfunctional? Yeah, that's, that's why I, I doubt very much there's going to be oversight and monitoring of this. I mean, I remember at the uh, March uh, 30th, 2010 uh, uh, conclave, uh, Congress at uh, the UN where they were planning out the aid dollars and Bill Clinton said, oh, we're going to have total transparency on this. We're going to have a website. It's going to show which countries have given what and where the money has gone and all this. None of that has happened. It's all a, a, a morass. Uh, and, uh, you know, to me, this is, again, part of the same thing with the NGOs, the Republic of NGOs, where the money goes out, goes, and I mean, Wyclef is just the tip of the iceberg. God knows how many among these. Well, we can uh, go into actually some of the, 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 the <coughs> allegations against Wyclef Jean's charity. Yeah. Uh, in in mid-October, the New York Times reported that the Attorney General's investigation, or an Attorney General's investigation into financial improprieties at, at Yale, uh, it found hundreds of thousands of dollars were spent on what it called improper transactions, for example, sending uh, Lindsay Lohan to a benefit at the cost of thirty-one thousand uh, dollars to a benefit that raised just sixty-six thousand dollars. The questions about other expenses as well. In 2010, Yale spent four point five million dollars, half its overall spending that year, on travel, salaries, consultants' fees, and office expenses. Yale also spent money on programs that never came to fruition, like ninety-three thousand dollars spent for homes that were never completed, one hundred forty-six thousand dollars for a medical center to have been housed in a geodesic dome. Um, again, I mean, it, it, is, it is shocking, Professor McGuire. That, that well, it is, and, and it's shocking as well how Haiti has become kind of a playground for the rich and famous. It's not just Wycliffe, mm. and, and uh, you've had a lot of superstars going into Haiti. I think in 2009, when Bill Clinton became the UN Special Envoy to Haiti. It was thought that star power would bring Haiti to the forefront. But Sean Penn's doing pretty well, isn't he? I mean, his, his, his charity seems to be a bit better than most of them. It, Surprisingly, yes, yeah. all the reports I see, and, yeah. and he's in for the long haul. But, uh, but there's others who come in, celebrity chefs, models, and so on, and, and the president of Haiti is, is very adept to charming them, and, and it's all very nice among this, this kind of jet-setting crowd. But, uh, but I think in the end, um, the issue is really accountability. Who is accountable to whom? And, and indeed, democracy is a major issue. I mean, we have to then set all of this uh, in the context of a great deal of upheaval uh, right now. In Haiti, Michel Martelly, the president, attempting various constitutional changes, huge demonstrations, Manolia. Um, I mean, what is going on? General strikes we're seeing. I mean, how responsive is Martelly's administration being to the, the sentiment we're seeing on the streets of Haiti? Not very much. I mean, for example, um, the largest demonstration that's happened since he's um, come into power was um, sort of on his way back from the UN when both he and the prime minister were out of the country, something that's happened more than once since he's taken over as president, which is not a norm in Haiti. Uh, under Preval, um, his prime ministers would be there if, if the president was traveling. But some of the constitutional changes um, with this, with this um, electoral council um, and some of the some of the challenges with the labor um, rights, the folks who actually got out on the streets were not necessarily all partisan. It wasn't just an opposition-led uh, movement. It was basically folks seeing that there hasn't been much change since he's been in office in a year. And it's and by change, they're referring to 
the, the same el elites, the same sort of connected folks have access to some of these dollars that are coming into the, to the country. And I'm going to include the NGOs in this sort of group now. And the masses are still sort of uh, recipients of e whether it's aid from their government or these foreign institutions. And so that, that's not change for them. That's the same thing, you well, know? I mean, and this, this, this oligarchy, <laughs> this is the same oligarchy from the Duvalier years, basically, isn't it? It's yes. the next generation. Yeah, the next, yeah. next generation That's the kids of the, the devaluers, yeah. basically. Yeah. Well, this this yeah. does kind of then bring in the uh, extension of the UN mandate, though. I mean, it's often asked why Minustar is actually there, but uh, but amidst all this sort of social unrest, I mean, there is that suspicion that the UN troops are there basically to to uh, help prevent some of the the, the the expressions of democratic discontent that we see by, through these demonstrations. That's, and, uh, that's how the Haitian sees, and that's what it is. I think. I think they are essentially a discount uh, uh, occupation force. I mean, the GAO here in the U.S. did a study and they found that it cost exactly half to have uh, U.N. troops do the policing in Haiti than it would be to have uh, U.S. Marines. So uh, to me, essentially, this is uh, the U.S. using the U.N. as uh, a proxy. Well, I, police I, force. I think a very important role the U.N. plays in Haiti is maintaining the focus on trying to reform Haiti's security apparatus through having a national police force that is under civilian jurisdiction. Um, the UN is pushing harder and harder in that direction. It's pulled back from some of its other mandates. Well, Martelli is pushing for a national but, but this, I mean, this is the problem. Martelli seems to be obsessed with wanting to have a, a recreate the, the, the disgraced Haitian army. And I think the day the UN is gone, he's going to have his way. Um, Kim so Ives, you, do you see them at the U.S. Uh, as a buffer for that? Yeah, I, well, to me, y yes, it's in a way the devil in the deep blue sea. On the one hand, you have this uh, Washington, France, and Ottawa uh, uh, um, directed uh, peacekeeping force, and on the other hand, you have the Neo Makuts trying to put back a Neo Makuts the army. The death squads under, yeah, the, uh, they under were the, the death squad under uh, Papa Doc and Baby Doc Duvalier. Uh, uh, the Tonto Makuts. So, in a way, um, the same way Papa Doc saw that it was you had to have your own uh, force, uh, that's what uh, Martelly sees as well, and he's uh, trying to recreate it uh, in the U.S., and, and him are having some sort of standoff about that. I Meanwhile, well, as far as the U.N. force is concerned, Manolia, any um, sense of responsibility, any compensation yet for the cholera outbreak, any, any pledge, for example, uh, to improve the water and sanitation system in Haiti? I, I, have, I couldn't find any. Well, they claim that there is um, on, on their end, and, and so um, though there haven't been a sort of um, confirmation of that, they claim that they've been helping with sanitation costs. In terms of actually taking responsibility, they have maintained um, the same, you know, we're not going there, we're moving forward. And it's impossible for a, a peacekeeping force that's supposed to be there to promote justice that has actually done injustice, though indirectly and unintentionally, to not even acknowledge that they've done this injustice by, by introducing cholera into the country. So how can, one, how can a peacekeeping force actually continue to promote justice when they won't even acknowledge their responsibility? And the other thing I'd like to say about that is, Yes, I do agree that one of the one of the main roles that they're playing is um, um, helping to beef up the national police um, security capacity. Like for instance, um, this week, um, one of the one of the major families, the Blunt, um, Clifford Blunt, was found um, was was allegedly arrested for um, for kidnapping ring, and they found like about over 265 police officers were involved in this kidnapping ring that he, that he and and some other major players have been running in the country. So um, these kinds of investigations are a positive sign in, in, in what seems to be a very dark sort of deja vu um, kind of set of policies. So I do agree with Professor McGuire about that. But by and large, um, to not acknowledge a severe injustice done to a people and to not even and, and to not take full responsibility of it is not good enough. And this sort of what's least is good enough for the Haitian people has been has been sort of touted from the UN to the US and its international partners and and this sort of government that they have put in place in Haiti right now. Meanwhile, hundreds of thousands still living in tents. I mean, I mean you see the amount of money being spent then on this this, this, this industrial park, perhaps with you know, underlying good intentions about decentralization. Uh, but why not spend this money on, a, on, ha on having a construction boom, on real jobs which will actually help the real economy? Yeah. Sure. It, it, it's kind of interesting to see Hillary Clinton giving the speech at Caracol and you juxtapose it with something she said in 2009 at a Hades Donors Conference here, which I think we need to keep reminding ourselves of. When she said, um, she said that there's, there's no lack of talent among Haitian people, but there's lack of opportunity. 
And um, I think that's a good kind of a roadmap to follow. What kind of opportunity can be set forth for Haitians to grab a hold of? I'm not sure that factory jobs are the kind of opportunities that most people are looking for, except there's, in the absence of anything else, it's there. But, you know, Haiti is such a creative place. Right. Um, but it has to be exploited. It has to be a will, I suppose. But we'll have to leave it there. Professor McGuire, thank you very much. Manolia Charlottetown, thank you. Kim Ives, thank you. That's all from the team in Washington, D.C. for now.